Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. On today's podcast, we're going to be investigating alcoholism. So we understand that alcoholism and addiction in general is a really big, powerful, complicated topic, but we thought that we would drop into a particular dimension around this that I think Jungians can lift up really usefully and significantly. So one of the focuses that I have when I work with people struggling with alcohol abuse or alcoholism is at the level of soul or psyche, what is it that they are reaching for? And is there another way to do that? So when I think about even my own experiences, particularly as, you know, a college kid back then. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was it? That was, long, that was a long time ago. <laughs> and thinking about my own experimenting with getting drunk and partying and the wildness that that provides. I'm in touch with this impulse to break free to not sense the limits of anxiety or uh, lack of confidence. Uh, it's very, you know, sort of Dionysian, you know, this sort of breaking the bounds, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of finding this sort of primitive elemental freedom, mm -hmm. something like that. Absolutely. And, and how powerful, how alluring that is. And, and how we can get trapped in that and thinking once we find alcohol as a path to breaking outside of the limits of ourselves, we can be tricked in some ways into thinking that that's the only way to expand beyond what we feel is hedging us in or worse, even oppressing us. Because I think many people that are vulnerable to alcoholism or currently struggling with it have a history of being raised in really difficult, painful circumstances. I remember one client telling me that after surviving a very difficult childhood, the first drink that they took at 12 years old felt like a miracle mm. because they had never felt relaxed before. Exactly. And what I'm thinking about is the flip side to this breaking free and the ebullience and the Dionysian liberation is the underlying insecurity and anxiety uh, from which escape is desired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the disinhibition and the release from anxiety. I, let's face it bravely, that's why people drink alcohol at all. It changes our mood. Whether one is an alcoholic, whatever you know, kind of definition around that uh, we want to come up with, and I don't know that there's a hard and fast one, uh, to over-drinking, to kind of getting high, to partying, um, we're, we're looking for a mood-changing experience because we want the shift. Something about the way it is right now, we want to change. Yeah, this is this is making me want to get a drink. <laughs> hey, listen, it sounds good. <laughs> me too. <laughs> but it, it puts on the table the the tremendous challenge which Jungian work I think is well equipped to meet, which is how do we forge a life that is so meaningful that we are not tempted to want to escape it, that we do not feel it's so insufferable that getting drunk or some well, other response We're not is looking necessary. in the wrong place for the transcendent. Yes. Yeah. That. Yes, absolutely. So, so this might be a good time. Can I read a little bit of um, Jung's letter to Bill W.? Oh, I think that would be great. So just as a context, um, some people may not know that the founder 
of AA had a therapeutic relationship with Carl Jung. And when he returned to the United States and continued his work to develop Alcoholics Anonymous, that some of Jung's support and ideas were instrumental in the founding of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and you know what? We'll link to this letter in the show notes too. Okay. Um, so he, they're talking about a third person here. This is Jung's letter to Bill W. His craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness expressed in medieval language, the union with God. How could one formulate such an insight in a language that is not misunderstood in our days? The only right and legitimate way to such an experience is that it happens to you in reality, and it can only happen to you when you walk on a path which leads you to higher understanding. You might be led to that goal by an act of grace or through a personal and honest contact with friends or through a high education of the mind beyond the confines of mere rationalism. I see from your letter that Roland H. has chosen the second way, which was, under the circumstances, obviously the best one. I am strongly convinced that the evil principle prevailing in this world leads the unrecognized spiritual need into perdition, if it is not counteracted either by a real religious insight or by the protective wall of human community. An ordinary man, not protected from an action from above and isolated in society, cannot resist the power of evil, which is called very aptly the devil. But the use of such words arouses so many mistakes that one can only keep aloof from them as much as possible. These are the reasons why I could not give a full and sufficient explanation to Roland H., but I am risking it with you because I conclude from your very decent and honest letter that you have acquired a point of view about the misleading platitudes one usually hears about alcoholism. You see, alcohol in Latin is spiritus, and you use the same word for the highest religious experience as well as for the most depraving poison. The helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. Wow. Mm. Yeah, Mm. there's so much in there. There's a lot of things we could talk about, and Jung used his language really carefully, didn't he? And and acknowledged that it could be misunderstood, particularly when he uses the word the devil. Mm-hmm. You can hear it in the letter. He's a little concerned as to whether or not that will be properly understood. Mm-hmm. And I think also I, I was having the same thought about the word when he was talking about a religious experience. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's important to note that Jung wasn't necessarily uh, using the word religious experience to refer to something within uh, a kind of a formal religious doctrine or, or a formal church. But I think he means more the sort of uh, a sense of being in contact with something numinous, with having a relationship with the infinite, to uh, understanding the ego's subordinate position to something that's larger than ego yeah. through the unconscious. Yeah, it's there in his words where he says something beyond the confines of the merely rational. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's looking for a transcendent experience, mm-hmm. which is, you know, what people can experience uh, with drinking, whether it's a joyful experience or r- really sort of fuzzing out and descending into a kind of a somnambulant kind of a state. It is beyond the merely rational. And he also says, Uh, the religious insight, the spiritual or transcendent. And he also says you find it in human relationship. Yeah. And I really want to underscore that, that that connection, uh, whether it's with something transcendent or another human being feeling connected. Yeah, and I think that there's new research on addictions that really bears that out. That when we have real significant attachments with others, then the the need for substances uh, is not nearly so powerful. Mm-hmm. And we can hear, with that in mind, how Jung's letter really reflects many of the values that went into the structure of Absolutely. AA in terms of the tremendous commitment to meetings and community, this relationship to the higher power. And I think importantly, the idea of characterizing 
the destructive impulses as separate from the ego. And this is a, a very Jungian idea that the human waking mind is powerfully influenced by these archetypal forces and that these powerful energetic structures can lead us to behavior that is life-threatening and they can lead us to behaviors that are life-sustaining and life-enhancing and that the ego as part of managing that must adopt a position of humility around it and one term we use is the relativization of the ego, that the ego realizes how vulnerable it is and therefore adjusts its behavior in a way that's more careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you sort of have respect for these archetypal forces in the unconscious that, you know, can sort of lead one to down this destructive path. And that attitude shows up in AA's work by the admission that the alcoholic cannot transform themselves by themselves, mm -hmm. yes. but that their character flaws must be transformed right. by a higher power, yep. which they are will willingly submit to as a transformative agent. That is the first of the 12 steps that we recognized we were powerless over alcohol. That might not be an exact quote. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, people that I've worked with in recovery talk about hitting your knees, or I hit my knees, of a kind of surrender mm, mm -hmm. that I and my ego and my willpower, whatever else may be available just to uh, the merely rational, as Jung says, is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, one needs to appeal to a higher power. And that is central to Jungian analysis, is that in a lot of modern psychotherapies, that the therapist will give the client clever strategies, ego strategies, oh to goodness. try to manipulate circumstances or manipulate mood. But central to Jungian work is the discovery that there is, in fact, a different center of the soul that is more akin to a spiritual force, and that healing occurs when we are in proper relationship to that secondary to any kind of tricks or strategies we might use to feel better. I'm also thinking about the connection, the higher power, but also, of course, what AA provides is human fellowship. That is very, it's very powerful. Uh, people care about each other. They go out to eat together. You can have a sponsor, someone that you can call really at any time, day or night for personal support and connection. Uh, there are there's a ritual to beginning the meeting, a structure to the meeting. Every meeting ends with the Lord's Prayer. These are human creations, human modes of of security and attachment. So it combines both of those things. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so another way we might say that is that this organizing life of affirming energy of the self or the higher power has to be mediated by the life affirming warmth of human relationships yes that yeah. it that it can't stay floating around as an abstract experience stepping back into this idea on an archetypal level one of the ways that I think that we can shape the discussion is that alcoholics are frustrated mystics. Well, I think Dostoevsky would certainly agree with you on that point. Um, I mean, and there's, you know, there's uh, some of the um, alcoholics in his novels, and I'm just sort of going through seeing if I can pull up any of their names. I don't think I can, but there's a there's an alcoholic in uh, Crime and Punishment. And, and you know, he, he says something like, God loves alcoholics more, you know, and that, that always struck me. And, and, you know, the other thing about that that I think is important that I love about Jungian work is that because we assume that everyone is striving toward wholeness and individuation. They may be frustrated, they may be going down the wrong path, but we're all sort of generally headed there. 
that whatever we've done, whatever terrible thing we've done, we can look back and say, and yes, and in some sense, this was the psyche's attempt to heal itself. This was the psyche's attempt to become more whole. It's not saying, gee, that was a great idea that you spent 20 years, you know, drinking, mm -hmm. but it is being able to cast that behavior in a light where we can see the positive uh, telos in it. I'm not so sure I totally buy this. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, okay, you know, there it's uh, the urge to, toward individuation is all very well and good, but I'm thinking about acorns and um, the telos of the acorn, the, the, the hoped for future of every acorn is to become an oak tree, but we know that they're not all going to become oak trees. That's right. And to some extent, if we um, compare ourselves to acorns, we have to have an intention to become a, a good uh, oak sapling and then a, a, bi a bigger and bigger tree. And I do think it's been my experience, I think, my observation, that people capitulate to the substance alcohol, that they yield to it. And I'm not sure that they are frustrated or want to be mystics so much as there's an infantilism mm -hmm. that takes place of I I will just soothe myself in this way and alcohol of course comes in a bottle and I will just lull myself to sleep or I will lull myself into some kind of unconscious infused state so that I don't have to face myself, what I'm doing, my anxieties, that, that doesn't feel too potentially mystical to me at all. And then I think physiologically, people become habituated. There's yes. a physiological component that the, the substance, in this case alcohol, uh, really does take over and create mm -hmm. an urge, much like smoking or any other drug. That in other words, if you're seeking transcendence, this is not a very adaptive way of doing it. it. Exactly. Yeah, and you know what? I I, I think I, that's all. I really love what you said, and I yeah, I think that's really important. And and it's like, and it's a both and. Right? Yes, you know? I, it's a both and. But but that's really important. I think you're you're right. It is a kind of collapse. It is a kind of um, forfeiting uh, sort of responsibility. And staying in that protected world of childhood, mm -hmm. where I don't have to do anything, I can just feel good. Mm -hmm this way with this substance and not have to shoulder my life tasks, mm -hmm. responsibilities, anxieties. I'll just sort of uh, wink out on all that. Well, I can hear the, the feeling and the language around uh, the substance being used as a defense against maturing, yes. as a defense against the struggles and the pains of life. And I think that once somebody is trapped in this false mysticism of being drunk, this false transcendence of using mm -hmm. a substance, there's a way in which all kinds of developmental tasks don't happen. Yes. And then by the time they wind up in treatment of one kind or another, there it's obvious, it's kind of glaring that all kinds of areas of the life are not being maturely attended to. Mm -hmm. So I, I would agree that that is symptomatically observable. We know that that's true. I think that as we're still looking at the core of the issue, it sounds like you're saying that the core of it is this refusal to mature on some level, which I still think would be at the level of the ego, that the ego is refusing to mature and therefore retreats to the bottle. And that may be true, I suppose, but I do think that the longing is still to transcend, at least temporarily, the isolation and the suffering that we experience somewhat existentially, which I think some people, in terms of the acorn and the oak tree, some people are born with a thirst and a demand to break free of this world on an existential level, which is a curse and a gift in some way. It's a question to my mind of whether one retreats to sort of an earlier kind of bliss 
of the infant or young child that can be lulled to sleep in, let's say, a mother's arms, of that earlier developmental kind of paradise, or whether one matures into a more mature kind of access to something that is transcendent, and Mm -hmm. whether the ego is is maturing and can become strong enough to to bear the pains of maturation. So so this is a wonderful example of a of a Freudian attitude versus a Jungian attitude. Are, are you accusing me problem. of being a Freudian? Not accusing it, just telling the <laughs> truth. <laughs> <laughs> just in this moment, just in this moment. And and both of them are positions with which to start the work with somebody. Well, and again, I mean, I, I think there's a way that they can both be true, you know, because you can be thirsting for something spiritual and not really have the, the an ego that's developed enough to do that transcendent thing in a mature way. So, so you're reverting back. You, you, you're sort of... Um, you're, Regressing? You're, it's a shortcut. It's, it's a it's, shortcut. Yeah. It's a regression. Yeah. But it's not a regression in service of the ego. Mm-hmm. It's not It's not a regression in service of development. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that there's a lot to say about this, and we'll probably have a, several more podcasts unpacking this. But it's time to shift to our dream work for the day. And uh, we have a dream submitted by a 27-year-old female. And she tells us that at the time that she had the dream, she had decided to look for another job, which was very frightening. But she knew she needed to have something with a bit more uh, reliable income that she began to feel a sensation of disappointment brewing around all of this, and that she was trying to cheer herself on, thinking that she has to muscle through it. She leaves with a statement that I think will be relevant to the dream, that she was trying to catch a glimpse of that half-sleeping thing stirring inside of her, which could feel overwhelming. So within all of this context and her fear of feeling guilt that she notes, let's sit with that and enter into the dream and see what comes forward. I'm accused of something I'm guilty of, loving the Pharaoh's daughter as she was my own. There's pictures and notebooks on my bag that prove it. So... I'm dismissed from my post as guard. I end up on the floor. They paint my face black. The pharaoh and the other guard go through my stuff. In several occasions, they're about to find the proof that I'm guilty. But there's a lot of other notebooks and books in my bag. So they don't find the incriminating ones. I love the opening phrase, I'm accused of something I'm guilty of. Mm. You know, right right away, there's the mm-hmm. setup of sort of guilt and accusation. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's a mm-hmm. lot here of, of little hints and um, a lot of guilt, shame, all the rest of it going on. But in, in the dream, uh, it, it's this relationship with the pharaoh's daughter and what else goes on. And I'm wondering what else she feels guilty of. Of Is it guilt because of looking for another job and a feeling of uh, betraying something that she loves? She says she loved her the job she has, but it doesn't have enough money. And is there something in relationship here uh, in the dream that might be a deeper level of all these feelings of of guilt. Well, you know, this is this is a this is there's some puzzling images to unpack here. One of the things I'm aware of is that we seem to be in ancient Egypt, mm-hmm. uh-huh. right? <laughs> and so immediately when I hear that we're in some kind of ancient setting, that often signals a big archetypal dream. 
Okay. There's, there's not there's not a lot more here to say uh, that that is necessarily the case, but that's one of the things I'm wondering about. That these are very big, sort of you know larger than self themes that we're dealing with here because we have the Pharaoh too. Mm-hmm. So that that's sort of God's representative on earth, mm-hmm. right? I think I was um, circling around but didn't say the image of guard. Uh-huh. I'm dismissed from my post as guard. The Pharaoh and the other guard go through the stuff of what's mm-hmm. being guarded uh-huh. here, uh, working for the Pharaoh theoretically and guarding the Pharaoh's daughter, we might imagine. Mm-hmm. That that's the part that has my curiosity. Mm-hmm. Of e- even though the real life context that she writes us about is about changing jobs, the dream says it's this archetypal setting of ancient Egypt and guarding something mm-hmm. that she didn't guard and mm-hmm. was dismissed for. As I just imagine myself in the world of the dreamer, just trying to put another level of meaning at it. If I was a guard in that kingdom, falling in love with the Pharaoh's daughter would be a tremendous transgression of status. That the lowliness of the guard pursuing the Pharaoh's daughter is somehow a violation of status. And then we might even imagine because the dreamer is female, that having a dream of falling in love with another female that somewhere in the psyche that creates an enormous conflict if she's not consciously aware of a kind of same-sex eroticism inside of herself. So we have two violations of social norms. One is the violation of status. The other is the violation of uh, sexual norms. And that the Pharaoh appears to show up as the enforcer of the norms and the great interrogator to find proof that her heart has betrayed her. Mm. There's another aspect of that too. It's not clear. What she writes is, loving the Pharaoh's daughter as she was my own means this is my daughter. Or did she mean to write as if she was my own? As in my own lover? Yeah. We don't. We don't know what we, that uh, we don't know of uh, what kind of love this is. You know, I'm. I'm just. I've been sitting with something, um, and and uh, I, I want to throw it out. And and this, I think, comes from my love of fairy tales. That I'm. I'm sort of hearing a fairy tale theme in here. There are a lot of fairy tales where a commoner uh, sort of plays suitor to someone who's royal. Yes. And oftentimes it's a prince, or excuse me, a common, uh, you know, laborer or something who says, oh, I want to marry the king's daughter or something like that. And it's always this outrageous thing. And there's often uh, some kind of mortal peril. You know, if you don't guess the riddle, then you're, you will chop off your head or whatever. So there's, you know, it's very high stakes, but of course it always works out. And it's this sense, I think, where maybe the ego in an early stage of development dares to ask for something more, you know, and and I I wonder if that isn't sort of what's happened here, that the dreamer has, has dared to love the Pharaoh's daughter. Yes, and has dared to follow her heart, to allow the desires of the heart to lead her feeling. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's relevant to the context we heard about her quitting a job that she likes well enough to try to find something better, to follow an impulse or that pays more. Mm -hmm. So to follow an impulse, you know, out of what's known or what her role is in perhaps a lower status context. And that, that evokes feelings of guilt and a feeling that this pharaoh figure inside of her will find her transgressing something so just following up on this kind of fairy tale theme i think that this is a setup where where the lowly person right uh dares to ask for something very grand you know then then what often follows is is a kind of initiation by desire Mm. so that the desire for something more leads you into your own path, mm-hmm. which is often troubled. Like the next thing that happens is, 
they have her on the floor and they paint her face black and they're going through her bag. It's like it's often sort of doesn't look so pretty. Right. But that what what often happens is it sort of sets you on your road, this desire. And my favorite example of this is, um, you know, it's going to be really obvious when I say it, but Oliver Twist. Mm. Oliver Twist <laughs> draws the short straw and, and says, please, sir, may I have some more? And they kick him out. And then he has a kind of nightsy journey where he works for the undertaker. And then he goes into a different kind of underworld of, you know, London underworld with, uh, you know, Fagin and the Artful Dodger and eventually kind of comes back to his true home. But, but it's, but I wonder if that's what's being shown here, just the beginning part of that, that she has dared to ask for more, dared Mm. to look for more. Mm -hmm. And now she's being brought low. She's on the floor. Her face is being painted black. But it may be the beginning of uh, of of a sort of um, hero's journey. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of two things. One is all of what you've said, and that um, even though they search through everything, they don't find the incriminating material, and how important it is to be able to have a secret, something that separates me from cultural norms or my mom and dad or my teacher of this kind of transgression that can really be in the service of of ego development. Yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. And I think it does speak to like the ego is take is claiming something for itself. Self, yes. The ego is claiming. And of course, that is what she's doing with this job yeah. situation is she's mm-hmm. claiming a little more. Yes. You know, and it's a secret and I'm not going to let you know about it. I also am um, aware that there's a, a doubling of there are pictures and notebooks in my bag that prove that the Pharaoh's daughter is my own. And then later she says, there are a lot of other notebooks in my bag, so they mm-hmm. don't find the incriminating ones. I'm wondering if that's an image of the work that she's done psychically, that all these notes and notebooks and pictures of of things that have been happening in Psyche to prepare her for this. Well, I I wonder if it's relevant here that uh, this person is a writer. Ah, a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. It certainly would, would lend a certain relaxation with her imagination mm-hmm. a certain heightened well and just the notebooks thing. would yeah. be sort of this this kind of product of her creative work mm-hmm. maybe i found myself um for some reason hoping that they would find the notebooks mm. um, really yes because i i felt like that that would suggest that something in the psyche is demanding that she stand in integrity with herself you are the one who loves the Pharaoh's daughter and stop pretending you're someone else. So what I, I love that. And what I would imagine is that that might show up in a subsequent dream. Mm-hmm. The first time that the ego claims more for itself, it often does so in a, in a way that has some trickster energy to it. Mm-hmm. These come along with images of lying or, um, or being tricky or deceiving or stealing. Mm-hmm. That this is, this is like, early efforts of the ego to say, no, I deserve more. And then subsequently you might see a dream with a theme where it can be held more consciously. So that transgression is in service to an Yes, I, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and then she's practicing. Mm-hmm. There are pictures and notebooks in my bag. There are other notebooks and, and books in my bag. Uh, there's work being done in her bag. Mm-hmm. Another container that can represent her own interior life. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I think your point's well taken that um, maybe later on there will be that mm-hmm. uh, claiming of it. Right. This is just the beginning. But this is just the beginning. It's preparation. And that the work is ready to begin because I think when when a client dreams about a piece of work and is able to capture that in a memory, that's often a sign that the work is ready to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this feels like the right place to stop, I think. Yeah, for we're today. all smiling, by the way. Yeah, this, this <laughs> dream was, Dear listeners. This, I think the stream kind of yes. landed us in a really, uh, yeah. I'm feeling like in a positive place about it. <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life 
From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.